Good morning, students. Good morning, schools. Uh, my name is uh, Wayne Fagan, and I'm chair of D. Howard International Education Foundation. And this morning, we are doing a virtual presentation to the schools, to the school in Paoli Public Schools in Oklahoma. We're delighted to be with you. Hello, students. Hello, Paoli. And uh, thanks for the wave. And we have, uh, and and we have as guests with us another rural school that is part of our rural school initiative in uh, Frankfurt, Ele Frankfurt Elementary in Frankfurt, Kansas. Welcome, Frankfurt, Kansas. And um, the uh, uh, this was organized with our, our uh, partners at the University of Texas in San Antonio. Uh, Cleese College of Engineering and Integrated Design. Uh, for short, if no one is offended, I'll just say UTSA from now on. And um, I have a few uh, house, uh, house cleaning chores, but first I would like to introduce our official representative from UTSA, uh, Jennifer McDaniel to uh, uh, say a few words of welcome to you on behalf of UTSA, Jennifer. Great, thank you, Wade, and absolutely no offense taken at all. Uh, I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning, and I'm even more excited that you're able to join us as we take on this topic, is there a future for you in engineering? And there absolutely is. My name is Jennifer McDaniel, and I am the Associate Director for Recruitment at Clusty College of Engineering and Integrated Design at UTSA. We're so excited to be partnering with Wayne and the D. Howard Foundation on this initiative that brings STEM-focused resources to our rural communities and schools. Now is such an exciting time to be an engineer. Did y'all know that the U.S. Department of Labor is projecting the total number of engineers in the U.S. will increase by 85,000? That is a ton of engineers by 2028. Uh, engineers are some of the most sought after people in the workforce, doing a diverse range of jobs. Now it's also an exciting time to be a roadrunner at UTSA. Um, so I want to ask y'all all, if you could put up your hand, I'm going to show y'all how to do our UTSA roadrunner. So everybody put your hand up and then put your three fingers down. So you just have these two, just like this. Perfect. That's our roadrunner sign. Uh, UTSA, we're recognized as a tier one research institution. So we do a lot of really awesome research in our field. Lots of experiential learning opportunities so you can do hands-on projects. We have a race car team on campus. We have robotics. We have aeronautics and rocketry club. So tons of things to get involved in. We have this really big makerspace on campus where you're able to work on projects, both large and small ones, where you can actually use a 3D printer that prints metal. So you can print pieces and parts and tools uh, to work on your projects. We also have really amazing faculty at UTSA um, who get lots and lots of money to do research in their fields. I personally invite all of you to our beautiful campus. We're in San Antonio, uh, so you can see for yourself what it's like to be a roadrunner. Again, I'm excited to be here, and I welcome you once again. Um, I'm excited for your future in engineering, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our friend Wade Fagan, and go roadrunners. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, uh, so um, I guess the first, this, um, uh, this virtual presentation is being recorded. And uh, for sound quality, I would ask that, um, uh, and also for technical uh, reasons, I would ask that uh, you mute uh, your, uh, uh, your mics if you're not uh, speaking. And that will help us as, as far as the uh, uh, recording is concerned. And after it's recorded, it will be posted, uh, the recording will be posted on uh, the um, uh, D. Howard International Education Foundation uh, website on the Rural STEM page. 
and uh, uh, quite possibly uh, Carlos uh, Velez of uh, UTSA can, is with us, can confirm also on uh, UTSA's uh, website at, at, at some place. Is that correct, Carlos? Yes, yeah, yeah, we'll put some online as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I also want to uh, give a special shout out to uh, the um, Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission and to Paula Keedy of the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission who helped introduce us to um, uh, Paoli uh, Public Schools uh, and uh, we're collaborating with the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission on all of our initiatives uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping. With that, um, let me uh, introduce you to uh, Carlos Velez, who is the um, Program Manager for Diversity and Outreach at the University of Texas, San Antonio, uh, to, um, who is also going to serve as our moderator. And so, uh, and uh, Carlos will introduce our speaker, and then uh, we'll go till uh, we'll reserve twenty minutes at the end, if if that works out, for questions and answers between the students at Paoli Public Schools and uh, Weedy Cutchell, our speaker, and and also finally, let me. Uh, give a special welcome also and uh, uh, shout out to uh, Corinne Franklin Bridlinger of uh, Paoli Public Schools, who is part of our uh, Rural STEM initiative. Corinne and all the uh, team at uh, Paoli, thank you so much for all of your efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Carlos, and I'll go on mute. And I'll uh, also stop my video, but I'll be with you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for the introduction. Um, so yes, my name is Carlos Velez. I'll be our moderator here for today. Um, and I'll, I want to get it over to Weedy as quickly as I can. So I'm going to do just a short introduction so you, you have an idea of who our guest speaker here is today. So Weedy graduated from UT Austin with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering in 1988. Uh, while in school, she worked at NASA, uh, Johnson Space Center, as an engineering co-op student. But after graduation, she moved to San Antonio to work in the aviation industry. In 2004, she started her own consulting company specializing in structural analysis of aircraft modifications and repairs on both commercial and military aircraft. Recent project work has included analysis and certification of antenna installations to give passengers access to wireless internet access on large passenger aircraft and continuing to support um, of the U.S. Air Force aging A-10, T-38, and C-5 fleet. Uh, Weedy is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Texas and a designated engineering representative through the Federal Aviation Administration. She is married to John, who is also a fellow aerospace engineer and enjoys several creative hobbies. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Weedy and we'll go ahead and let her get started. So thank you all. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Um, well, let's see. I've got a presentation here. So let me go ahead and share that so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. Share screen. Which one? Okay, can you see the screen now? Now, where'd everybody go? I want... We can see you. Yeah, I was hoping I would still be able to see the students better, but it's shrunk down my view. Uh, let me pull that back out. Okay, come on, bigger. Ah, there we go. Now I can see y'all again. Okay, so as Carlos said, my name is Weedy Cutchell. And I am going to talk to you all today about engineering, uh, specifically about aerospace engineering. But first, we'll talk a little bit about other things, too. And so let's go on with that. Um, Carlos told you a little bit about me. Um, what wasn't in my bio is that I grew up in a rural community. The school I went to through my freshman year, there were 
45 kids total in my grade, although my in my elementary school, we were split up, so there were only like 15 or 20 kids in my grade. But in in that that school that fed the high school, there were, like I said, about 45 kids in my grade. My sophomore year, we moved about 10 miles, and I started going to the big school in town, and I graduated with 100 classmates in my grade there. So it was still kind of a small school, a little, little closer to the experience that y'all have than most kids in cities, but um, it just, it helped me appreciate different things than, than kids growing up in the city. But I did grow up uh, in a farming community, and I think that was good incentive to go to college and get an education and do something else. I really like being an engineer more than more more than I would have liked being a farmer, although a lot of engineers work in the farming community, too. There's a lot of equipment that uh, needs to be designed and built and uh, made better. And so there's all sorts of possibilities in every walk of life for engineers. So talking about that, what do engineers do? Do y'all have any ideas about what, what engineers do? Anybody? Um, can we can we unmute Paoli so I can hear a few ideas from students? Anyway, um, in, if if we just think through, you know, think about things that you think engineers do. They they you know design things, they build things, but mostly engineers solve problems. You know, the problem might be we need to design a building down on coastal Texas where they have hurricanes and we want it to be able to withstand, a, you know, a hit by a hurricane. The, the problem might be we want to send people into space and we got to figure out how to do that. The problem might be we want to be able to generate electricity more efficiently and cheaper so that everybody has access to heating and cooling and internet and all those things we, we love these days. So there's so many different kinds of problems for engineers to solve. And because there's so many different kinds of problems for engineers to solve, engineering offers very challenging and interesting jobs. Um, and because you know, not just anybody can do it, the pay tends to be pretty good too. But it's really cool to be able to see things that you've worked on help other people that people are using. And so now the next question is, so what kinds of engineers are there? Have y'all heard about any other kinds of engineers? I mean, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer, but what does that really mean? So I like to split engineering up into kind of five main categories. There's civil, mechanical, chemical, electrical, and biomedical. And so civil engineers um, design and build things like buildings and bridges and dams and highways, basically big things that sit on the ground and don't move anywhere. That's the sort of stuff that civil engineers usually work on. And then there's mechanical engineers, and mechanical engineers typically work on things that move. So this might be engines, cars, airplanes, assembly lines, tools, um, you know, the, the, the tools to, make, to build other things with. Um, even something like a roller coaster is something that a civil engineer would be involved in. And you, you notice I mentioned airplanes in that list because aerospace engineering is kind of a specialty subset of mechanical engineering. And so um, aerospace engineers have specialty training in the area of, of things that are specific to airplanes. But in general, um, a lot of mechanical engineers also work in the aviation industry. So then we've got chemical engineers, and chemical engineers help develop structural materials for those of us that work in the civil engineering or, or mechanical or aerospace engineering world to, to use. Also, fuels and lubricants to help moving parts move better. Um, then in another industry, fertilizers and pesticides are things that chemical engineers uh, work to develop and make better. And, you know, that goes into farming and for the food industry, because when you really come down to it, what we're all made of and what we eat is all made up of chemicals. And, you know, most of the chemicals of the things we eat are naturally occurring things that are made from plants or animals, but it all breaks down to chemicals. So there's a lot of chemical engineering in the food industry, developing ways to preserve food better, to make food taste better and all that cool stuff. And so it's really funny how much engineering actually goes into all these different kinds of industries. Uh, then we've got electrical engineering. And so there's several different aspects to electrical engineering even. You've got the power systems people who design and build things like the, the power uh, distribution and the power generation for a city or for a building. 
Uh, then you've got the electronics end of electrical engineering. So the, the people who are designing and building things like cell phones and TVs and computers and all those cool things that, that um, we, we, they're just a big part of our world. And then the other side of electronics is the software side. So, so a lot of the main category of electrical engineers is software engineering. And so um, you're making all the hardware know how to do its job because without the, the software to program the computer, the computer is just kind of a brick. It, it doesn't, you know, the hardware by itself doesn't have any smarts. It's what, how, how the software tells it to do things that makes it be, be capable. Uh, the last category on this list is biomedical engineering. And the, the cool thing about biomedical is this is where engineering meets medicine. So this can, again, be in several aspects. So some engineers come into biomedical engineering with more of a chemistry and chemical engineering background, looking at materials and, and things that interact with the human body in good, in good ways, not bad ways. Um, better materials to like coat uh, prostheses, like for an artificial hip and things like that. And then uh, some people come to it from the electrical engineering side. And so these would be people who help develop uh, equipment like CAT scan machines or ultrasound machines. All these things were developments, the engineering developments that are applied to medicine. And then there's also um, some people come to biomedical engineering from more of a mechanical background. So people who would design things like um, prosthetic arms or artificial hips or knees. Um, you know, or even like an artificial heart. You know, there's a lot of interaction between different kinds of engineers in a lot of industries, and especially working with doctors in the medical field. It takes, you know, all kinds of engineers to do things like that. And so it's, it's a really cool field. So now that's enough about engineering in general. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one aspect of something that I do in aerospace engineering. So my, my primary job in aerospace engineering is to look at the structure of airplanes and make sure things are strong enough and make sure that they'll last long enough to uh, be safe to fly. But some of the things we look at involve things moving. So there's a topic called structural dynamics, and that's two kind of, kind of interesting words that you may not have heard before. You may not have heard them used together, certainly. And so we're gonna break that down and figure out what structural dynamics means. So a structure is something we build. So the building that you're sitting in is a structure. The, the, the chairs that you're sitting on and the table next to you, those are structures. Um, the shell of an airplane that holds it all together is a structure. Um, a tower is a structure. And so just you can visualize that, you know, everything has structure. Um, then the word dynamic, what does dynamic mean? You may not have even heard that before, but dynamic gives a sense of motion. It's things that are moving. And so when we put those together, the study of structural dynamics is the study of how structures move and what makes structures move. And so there's uh, all kinds of things. If it's um, a, a tall building, it might be the wind that makes it move or an earthquake that makes it move. If you're talking about a car, the vibration of the engine uh, makes things shake and move in the car, as well as making it move down the road. And as the car moves down the road, running over bumps um, can make it move in odd ways. Um, and certainly hitting another car or hitting something unexpected would make things of the structure move in unexpected ways. And so engineers study all these different ways of things moving to make sure that the structures we're designing are adequate and will hold up to the kind of loads that we put on them. And we do this by using math. We can use mathematical equations to describe how structures behave. And so before we get uh, into the, to that too much, I've got a cool little video I'm going to show. Um, some years ago, uh, back in 1940, so even before I was born, uh, some engineers had an, a, an idea that they were going to design and build a beautiful bridge. And it was going to be the, the longest uh, narrow, you know, most elegant bridge of its type that had ever been built. And this was out on the West Coast in uh, Washington, just you know, a little north of California. And so these engineers, they thought about things that might make the bridge move because um, that's an area where they have earthquakes. And so they did design the, um, the bridge 
to be able to handle earthquake loads, but it didn't occur to them that wind could have some effect on their bridge. And, and it turns out the wind had, a, had some very big effects on the bridge. So we're going to look at a video. Uh, let me get that pulled up. Carlos, um, did that, did my screen change? Are you seeing the video now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge shortly uh, after, about, about three months after it was put in service. Um, this is, this bridge is made out of steel and concrete. Doesn't look like it though, does it? It looks like, you know, rubber or something, the way it's moving. But this is, um, again, just made out of standard steel, concrete, you know, asphalt top. Um, and, you know, look what happened to it. And so let's let's watch that again, because it's just kind of crazy. Um, so it turns out, and I've got another little um, blurb that'll show this too. When wind moves, blows, was blowing across the side of the bridge, the way the wind curls around the bridge and has some turbulence just puts a little bit of force on the bridge. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But just you can see in, in this video how the bridge was moving and shaking. And we're going to look at some other um, structures that move and shake. And there we go, back to that. And then let's see. What we're, oh, so we're going to see how to structure. We're going to talk about how to structure shake, why to structure shake, and why on earth does an aerospace engineer care about structure shaking? So let me unshare, and I've got a little demo to show. So let's pull this up, make sure you can see it. Okay. Can everybody see my little demo here? So this is a structure. Or you could say it's three structures, depending on your frame of reference. So this is just a, a little demo that I put together to, to show how structures shake. So this structure, this could be, say, the wing and tail of an airplane. This could represent components on a little circuit board. This could be buildings. Just for the sake of something easy to visualize, let's say this is buildings. So we've got a tall, skinny building here, a really tall one. Let's say, let's, let's say this is uh, the Eiffel Tower. Everybody's seen pictures of the Eiffel Tower. You know, it's real tall and skinny. And then this, this one, this little short one is something real short and squatty. Say may, maybe the McDonald's down on the corner. Okay. And then the one in between, let's say this is a high-rise hotel, you know, like a Marriott or something. So we've got our Eiffel Tower, a Marriott, and a McDonald's restaurant. So those are, you can visualize three very different structures, right? So what happens, what do you think will happen if we have an earthquake on our structures, you think they're they're going to move, right? Well, let's see what happens. Can you see what's going on there? The Eiffel Tower is kind of going crazy, but the Marriott and the McDonald's really didn't do very much. What do you think will happen now if we have an even a faster earthquake? You think that the Eiffel Tower will go even crazier? Let's see what happens. What'd the Eiffel Tower do? It just kind of hung out, didn't do anything. But the Marriott went crazy. Um, what, the McDonald's still just kind of hanging out. So the McDonald's is doing good. So what do you think will happen if we have an even faster earthquake now? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Sure enough, we can get the McDonald's going. So now the question is, why does that happen? So it turns out every structure has ways that it wants to shake. And so the, the McDonald's here wants to shake at this really fast speed. The Eiffel Tower here wants to shake at this slower speed and the Marriott, the one in between. If I shake this at the speed that it wants to shake at, in engineering terms, that's called a resonance or a natural frequency. If I shake it at that speed, it goes crazy. But if I shake it at some other speed, it just kind of hangs out and doesn't do anything. Um, and so that's that's the one thing related back to the um, Tacoma Narrows Bridge now is that one day the wind was making it shake at a slightly different speed, and that corresponded to the speed that the bridge just naturally wanted to shake at. But you notice that was that really weird shape that it shook at. 
So let's let's look at a, another little quick demo here. Any idea what this is? Slinky, yeah, yeah. Everybody loves slinkies, right? So look look at how I'm, it doesn't take much force at all. My hands are hardly moving, but you can see the slinky just really moving a lot, right? Now, if I shake it again, still very gently at a different speed, it's gonna shake in a different pattern. So at this speed, it wants to go in this pattern. And then if I do, let's see if I can do one more here. So once you find the right speed, it hardly takes any effort to make it go crazy. And you can keep doing other faster speeds and find other shapes, they're called mode shapes in engineering terms, as far as how that structure wants to shake at a very specific frequency. And so that that's more the idea on that bridge. There was a very specific shape that it wanted to uh, shake at. So now let me pop back into the video here. So we talked about these things. So now let's go talk about the bridge again. So when the air blew across the bridge, it would just curl around the back side. And when it did that, it would give, oh, oh, you can't see it yet, sorry. Now you can see it. Okay, so when the airflow would go along the bridge, it would uh, curl along the back side. And as the turbulence curls along the back side there, it just gives a little bit of a push. So the air goes around here and gives a little bit of a push and it curls around here and gives a little bit of a push the other way. It's kind of like, who's, a, who's ever been on a swing? Anybody? Okay. And, or have you pushed a younger brother or sister or cousin on a swing? How do you go high? You don't have to push hard, right? You just have to push at the right time. Just keep putting a repeated little push at the right time and you'll go really high. And that's kind of what the air, the wind was doing on this bridge. It would just give it a little push a little push, kept giving a little push, and then one day the wind blew a little bit different speed, and those pushes were at a little bit different speed, and so it excited that frequency, that mode shape, that the bridge, how it just wanted to shake, and it went crazy. Now, the funny thing is, ever since the bridge opened, it always shook a little bit, and in fact, it got a nickname, Galloping Gertie, that because you know it was a, it was a joke, but it felt normal to people because they whenever they drove across it, it just shook a little bit. Uh, but then again, one day the wind blew a little bit different speed, so it shook the bridge at a little bit different speed, and that happened to be the speed that it made it want to shake in that particular way, and it shook itself apart. So now the question is, why do we care in airplanes about things shaking that way? And um, it turns out that the wing of an airplane um, and the rest of the airplane too, but the wing is something that's easy to visualize, can, has ways that it wants to shake and very specific shapes um, for, for each wing and very specific frequencies that it wants to shake at. So if we're doing something by how the air flows over the wing or the vibration of the engine, the propeller or whatever, that excites one of those shapes, then it can be very bad because you saw the bridge tore itself apart. An aircraft wing can tear itself apart if, it, if you excite one of these shapes. So um, aerospace engineers learned early on to design the aircraft so that it wouldn't be possible or to minimize the possibility of exciting one of these shapes. So nowadays, if you, if any of you have ever flown uh, on an airliner and looked out at the wing, when you hit some turbulence, you'll see, you, you might see the wing shaking a little bit, but it shakes and then dies out because it's not something that's hitting a, a speed, a frequency that makes the one, wing wanna shake a whole bunch. And so again, engineers learn that that's something that needs to be designed around. So why it's important in my job, most of what I do is modifications and repairs to airplanes. So any kind of change we make to an airplane, we have to check and make sure that nothing we change is going to make things bad for the airplane, that we're not going to, to make something that's going to make, make the airplane get one of these uh, vibration modes that it didn't have before, or make it in a different frequency that now could be excited. So we have to check things like that for any change we make to, to the structure of an airplane. And so that will, will lead into 
um, I really like my job. Um, what I do is fun. Uh, there is a lot of variety in the work I do. Um, I, when I was in school, I never envisioned a job like the work I do. As far as looking at um, you know, something that's already there and figuring out how to fix it or how to make it last longer, how to, you know, just how to make it better. Um, it's really cool to see that the things that I work on are actually needed. They get used, you know, that they're helping, you know, the, the work I do to extend the life of military airplanes, uh, that, that is a, you know, I see the direct results that I'm being a good steward of our tax dollars. I'm, I'm helping the funds, the limited funds that our government has to keep the airplanes flying, helping those go further at the same time, keeping our pilots safe. And, you know, because it's there's challenges in the work I do, people pay me really well to do it. Some of the things that, that I work on, a lot of other people uh, think are dull or boring and wouldn't want to do, but I think they're exciting. And that's one of the cool things about engineering is there's so many different kinds of jobs, so many, many different way, ways of working that you can find the little niche that's the thing that you like to do. And if other people don't like to do it, then they're really happy for you to do it and they want to pay you to do it. And, you know, it's like I, I feel the same way about some other areas of engineering. There are things I wouldn't want to do, but I have friends who love doing them. And, and so it, it just works out really nice that, you know, you can find what really works for you. And the, one of the cool things about engineering also is for the, for the most part, people really just judge me on my capabilities, what I'm able to do. They don't care how young or old I am. They don't care that I'm a girl. Um, they just care that about my knowledge, what my training and knowledge is and, and how I can best help a project. And that's kind of a, a nice place to be. So now just real quick, I'll, I'm going to tell you about a project I worked on recently that was a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, most, of, most of the work I do is sitting in front of a computer and building computer simulations of the structures of airplanes so that we can see how changes are going to affect them. Occasionally, I get to do some work in a test lab uh, you know, on real hardware and stuff. But again, mo most of my work is on the computer, not, not out on real airplanes. I work with a lot of mechanics and technicians who are the ones who usually get to crawl around in the airplane and do the fun stuff. Um, but on a project last year, I got to, to in addition to being the, the engineer helping develop what we were doing, I also got to be one of the technicians installing equipment on the airplane. And so this, uh, this is a um, C-5 aircraft, which is the largest airplane that our U.S. Air Force flies. And it's very big. Um, it flies cargo all over the world, but these airplanes are old. Most of them are more than 30 years old. So there was some equipment on the, the airplane that helps monitor how they fly. So the engineers have data to figure out what might, um, what might be wearing out and how to repair things before they break, because that's kind of important in airplanes. Um, and so we were replacing some of that monitoring equipment. And so this picture here is me sitting on top, very top of the tail of one of these airplanes in the hangar. And then just another view of the airplane. So this is the tail of that C-5 with, you can see all the scaffolding around it. So it's about six, six flights of stairs to get all the way up to the top um, with the platform below the tail. And um, we, we climbed those stairs several times a day for the, the time we were working on these airplanes. Uh, but yeah, the, right down here is a person. So give you a sense of how, how big this airplane is. But Cool things. And just in summary, aerospace engineers work on a lot of things besides airplanes. Um, pretty much anything that moves. There's, uh, you know, all kind of space stuff, you know, rockets and missiles, satellites and spacecraft, but also cars and trains because the aerodynamics, how the airflow goes around things is very important for making things more efficient and quieter. And so that's, that's an area where aerospace engineers typically have more training than a typical mechanical engineer. Uh, but in addition, you know, a lot of aerospace engineers I know uh, go, went to work in the software industry, um, but some work on specifically on engines. And um, even you know, there, there are toy companies that hire aerospace engineers to design, you know, model rockets and model airplanes and stuff. So, you know, how cool would that be? But yeah, there's, there's all sorts of fun things that aerospace engineers work on. And so there's some uh, websites here that have a lot of information 
that uh, you might want to investigate further. Um, AIAA is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, so you can get info on aerospace careers there. <clears throat> NSPE is the National Society of Professional Engineers, and that is engineering in general. So that they're really focused on civil engineering, but you can get a little bit of information about all kinds of engineering careers there. SWE is the Society of Women Engineers, and again, this is a, a, a group that it has all kinds of engineers in it, so you can get information about all kinds of engineers. SA Best is a robotics program I'm involved in. SWRI is um, one company I do a lot of work for, and they do work in every field of engineering you can imagine. So if you go out to their website, you can get uh, project descriptions for a lot of cool things. And then NASA needs no introduction. Everybody knows NASA. That's, you know, the aerospace engineers. That's cool stuff. You know, plant, planets and rockets and satellites. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. To, to, are there questions now? Yeah, absolutely. So if we have any questions from uh, our folks over at Pauli or, or any of our, our, our friends over in Frankfurt, feel free to put any questions over into the chat. Um, or if you'd like, you can always unmute yourself as well. And yeah. Ask questions out. I think some... So, yeah, so most schools are muted. So either uh, Paoli, either unmute or uh, give us some chat. All right, Liam, go ahead. Have you built a missile? So have you built a missile? Have, you built have a I missile? built a missile? I have not built a missile, but I do have friends who work at companies that build missiles. Yeah. I think air, I think airplanes are more interesting, but they think missiles are more interesting. So go figure. <laughs> Have you got to go inside the stuff that you make? Occasionally, um, very, very occasionally, I get to actually go inside the, the or onto the things I, I make. Um, early in my career, I worked on a very large, um, complete interior for a 747, which is a, a large airliner. And so we were doing a kind of a pimp my airplane sort of thing. And um, I got to go on a test flight for that aircraft. So we were up there for a couple of hours checking on things, making sure that that er, you know everything was doing what it was supposed to, because airplanes move a lot in, in the air. They flex a lot. So the, 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 the pieces like big galleys and walls and things that we put in the airplane, we had to make sure nothing was binding or anything. So I got to fly on that one. That was cool. Have you worked on a B-52 bomber? I have not worked on a B-52 bomber, but that is an awesome airplane. Has an airplane ever broke before? Say that again? Has an airplane ever broke before? Has an airplane ever broke before? When, um, I've worked on a lot of airplanes that have broken, but because my job was to figure out how to fix them. But more often, um, we engineers try to figure out what's going to break before it happens. Because think about this. If you're driving along in your car and your car breaks, what happens? You pull over to the side of the road. You probably get mad, call somebody for help. But usually nobody gets hurt. Think about this. You're flying along in your airplane and your airplane breaks. What happens? You know, it's um, not necessarily an immediate death sentence. But you can imagine that it's much more serious than when it happens in your car. So especially for older airplanes, it, uh, the work I do for the Air Force is on some of the fleets of airplanes that are older, like the C-5. And so our job is to do testing and analysis to try to predict what might break in the future and then fix it before it breaks. And that's a lot more challenging than just fixing things after they're broken. But it's also very important to do that predictive work um, in airplanes because we don't want them to break unexpectedly. How many years will you need to have of experience for you to fly a plane? To fly a plane, um, there's several routes to getting uh, pilot training. So um, some, pi depending on what kind of airplanes you want to fly and all. So some, some pilots uh, get into it through military training. 
And that, so not uh, typically you have um, some education first and then a couple of years of pilot training. But to, to get into, if you're going through private pilot training, again, there's ground school first and then the, the practical training. But it, it's two or three years, uh, really, but depending on if you're going full time or part time um, on private training. And uh, not, I'm not a pilot myself. Um, I appreciate being in an airplane and being able to look down, but I, I like it when someone else is at the controls so I can just look out and, and see cool stuff instead of having to worry about flying the airplane. Uh, but yeah, there's, there are a lot of different ways to get pilot training. Um, but again, you know, one of the best ones is to go through the military service. And, you know, then some, some of those military pl pilots end up flying smaller airplanes, the fighters, and some of them end up flying bigger airplanes, the cargo airplanes. And a, a lot of those pilots, you know, ultimately after they retire from the military, then fly airliners. But then some other people go through private pilot training and work their way up to flying the big airliners. So you said you're an engineer. What was the hardest design you ever had to make? Different designs are hard in different ways. One of, one of the more challenging projects um, I worked on just from just from concept was uh, uh, it was called a high altitude airship. And so this was kind of a, a blimp sort of thing. But just thinking about the scale of it was amazing. We were looking at feasibility studies just to see if the fabrics that we currently can make would be strong enough to, to hold the pressure of this thing. And so it was kind of, um, you know, oblong shaped, but then it had tail fins on the back. And so each tail fin, just the tail fins on this blimp were so big, you could park a semi truck sideways, you know, a big 18 wheeler with a trailer and everything sideways inside one of these fins. And just thinking about the scale of that project made it difficult because it's, it's so much bigger than any, anything else that I'd ever really thought about designing or, or building. And so figuring out how to analyze a kind of structure that doesn't have any structure until you put air inside it and, and make it because it's just a fabric envelope. And then you inflate it and you put pressure in it and then it you get some stiffness to it. And just the whole concept of how do you analyze a structure that isn't a structure until you put loads in it. It was kind of a concept. But but you know working with a team of people, we figured out a way to do simulations that would allow us to do analysis for that structure. And that's the, the one of the, the things also in engineering, it's very rare that I'm just working alone on a project. You know, most projects involve teams of engineers uh, working on different pieces and, and feeding ideas to each other. Um, it's like you, I'm usually working with design staff that are coming up with ideas for designs and then, then I'm evaluating them to see what will work and what won't work and then how we can make the design better. More questions. How, how old do you have to be to be able to fly a plane? Um, I know there are some minimum ages. If you're if you're going to fly a plane commercially, there's minimum ages. But just to to get private training, um, I know there have been pilots as young as about twelve, I think, in some situations. But again, it takes a few years to get the training to be able to to solo in an airplane. But yeah, there's there's nothing that keeps a student who's capable from learning how to fly. Uh, but if you're going to fly for somebody paying you to fly, you have to be a bit older. Has anybody died when they were flying a plane? Oh, lots of people have died flying planes. Uh, air, air, you know, just like driving a car, people die driving a car. It's it's a you know mechanical device, accidents happen. Um, so, and that's, we as engineers try to make those accidents less likely to happen. And that's our job is to figure out the things that could go wrong and try to prevent them from going wrong. Just the same way as in cars, you know, we, we work to make cars safer and easier to operate and harder to get into accidents with. And we do the same thing with airplanes. How long have you been doing this? I have been an engineer for... Oh, 34 years. Um, I, gra I graduated with my engineering degree in 1988. And even before then, I was doing some engineering work because as an aerospace engineer, you know, it was the space program that got me interested in, in engineering. And so when I got a co-op job in college working at NASA, it's like that was just too cool. But 
my co-op job, the first time I went to NASA, I was working on airplanes. And so that surprised me. I didn't even know NASA had airplanes, but they do. And because their pilots, the, the, the shuttle pilots also flew airplanes to keep current. And there's lots of other reasons NASA has airplanes. Uh, but then some of my other um, work tours at NASA, I did work on other things that were more space related, like the, the space station that didn't exist yet when I was there and that does now. Um, but, uh, you know, it just, it's, it's funny that there's so many different things that you can work on and they're all interesting. Were you in the military? I was never in the military. I was fortunate to get some college scholarships that paid for my school. But if I hadn't gotten those scholarships, I would have gone into the military to, in order to get an education. Yes. And I do work a lot with the military because, uh, uh, some of the, some of the airplanes that I work on are military products. Have ever worked on German airplanes? I have not worked worked on uh, any German airplanes. I have seen a few, but no, I haven't worked on any. What is your biggest airplane that uh, you have worked on? The the largest airplane that I've ever worked on was the C five that I showed you pictures of at the end of the presentation. Um, the second largest would be the seven forty seven, which is one of the one of the biggest airliners that that you would ever fly on. Do you know how long it took to make the C5? How long did it take? You know, I'm not. You know, I should go back and look. Uh, it, it the development of the C5 took took years, and then just building one on the production line, I would say, would be a matter of of months to maybe a year. Um, but just just the the rework we were doing. So the the C5s, um, since they're older airplanes, they get brought into the hangar and. Not not completely stripped down, but they they take a lot of things apart so they can look at at uh, some some of the more important structure to make sure we're not developing any cracks, and just those inspections take about a month, and they do them every five to ten years depending on how the airplane's being flown, and so we were doing our work in the middle of one of those inspections while the airplane was already on the ground and in the hangar, and so but the, but for especially for older airplanes. It's very routine to bring them in and, you know, pretty much tear them apart and rebuild them every so often just to make sure that's one way we keep to make sure that things are safe. Have your landing gear ever broken? Um, not mine personally, but I have worked on a project, and I'm sorry I didn't throw pictures in, um, of um, an A-10 airplane with a broken nose landing gear. It kind of looks sad, you know, sitting up like this, but that, that was... Um, kind of a problem in the fleet that they were having issues with the nose gear uh, breaking. And it fortunately, normally it didn't mean a lot of damage to the airplane, uh, but we did figure out what the problem was and um, you know ma made sure that it would not continue to happen. Has anybody who you ever known crashed a plane? I have known people who have crashed airplanes, yes. I think that's all of our questions. Okay. Yeah. So um, I know we have we have Frankfurt and Mr. Rob's class over there. So if, um, if y'all have questions, you can absolutely uh, ask them. Y'all have a couple questions. Well, what, do, it looks like we got time for that. Yeah, I, I see. We do have one in the chat. So they asked, oh, "When did you first see. get? When did ah, you first get interested I, in?" Okay. This? So some of my some of my earliest memories um, when I was first learning to read, um, one of my older cousins was into science fiction uh, books. And we read a book together called Young Visitors to Mars. And that that kind of got me started down a road of, of being really interested in science fiction and, you know, all, you know, going out into space and all this stuff. But as far as translating that into what I might do as a career and getting in, interested in engineering, I was probably in about eighth or ninth grade before um you know, I had ever heard the word engineering. I was always one of those kids that tinkered with stuff. You know, my mom would hand me things to fix because she knew I would. <laughs> and and I, I, I had fun with it. Um, but, you know, I like taking things apart and putting them together. And so it, it, it's like, I think the adults around me probably had a better idea that engineering might be in my future than I did. Because I just, you know, when I was your age, I didn't know anything about that or what engineers were or what they did. But as I started looking at, 
uh, colleges and what I might study, then it, that's when it came a little more into focus. And at, and at that point, my mom worked at an engineering company. And so she would tell me about the stuff that they did. And she's like, you would like doing this stuff. And so that helped me understand that that engineering was was the word for what I was looking for. Um, the favorite, my favorite part of my job is that um, I get to do a lot of different things. It's never boring. And um, so it, it just, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I, I really like what I do. And, and I have fun. A nice thing about being a consultant is it gives me a lot of flexibility in my time. So I can do things like this uh, career talk for you guys. And that's something I really like about my job. So Frankfurt, I hear you have to leave pretty soon. So thank y'all for joining us today and, and enjoyed meeting all of y'all. And Paoli, I'm so glad to talk to y'all too. And with that, so if, if y'all have any other questions, feel free to let us know. But with that, before we do close out today, I do want to pass it back over to Wayne so we can um, have some, some closing remarks. But um, let us know if you do have any questions, feel free to come back up as well. Oh, Carlos, thank you. And um, wait a minute. Not that you're missing anything with uh, uh, me not being on video, but I'm there now. Uh, just a word about what's in the background. So uh, what Weedy didn't mention is that uh, one of the things is that uh, Weedy uh, worked at the D. Howard Company mm -hmm. here in San Antonio. I believe John, her husband, yeah, also absolutely. worked at the yeah. D. Howard Company in engineering. And uh, I was at the D. Howard Company uh, around that time uh, as well. And uh, so what you see in the background is a, a part of the D. Howard Company back then, those red hangers and the airplane that is uh, flying over, and, and that's not Photoshop, that's a, a real airplane flying over a real hangar at San Antonio Airport, and that's a BAC-111 aircraft uh, that we were modifying. Uh, that aircraft was originally built by a British Aircraft Corporation in England and uh, was powered by Rolls-Royce uh, engines. And we were changing the engines out on that aircraft uh, from Rolls-Royce Spey to Rolls-Royce Tay engines. Weedy mentioned that <clears throat> she had worked on a 747. Well, uh, we had several 747 projects uh, uh, at the D. Howard Company. I was just wondering if the 747 she was uh, referring to was one of those airplanes. It, it, it was. And um, yeah, I w worked on several of the, the big mods there at D. Howard. And John and I both worked on that Mach 111 project as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, great. And um, let me just uh, thank everyone uh, for your participation today. Uh, a special thanks to um, um, uh, our friends at uh, Paoli uh, Schools in, in Oklahoma. We're just thrilled to have had you with us, and we're going to uh, stay in touch with your school and do other things with your school as we are with all the rural schools. Uh, we couldn't uh, do this without uh, the support and collaboration we we um, receive uh, with our friends at uh, UTSA uh, and uh, a special thanks to Carlos for the great work that he does and Jennifer for, for joining us. And um, um, uh, I, after watching uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, my only takeaway from Jennifer's uh, comments was I knew I wasn't very good at what I do here on this show, but I didn't realize how bad I really was until Jennifer talked. And uh, so uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for, for being with us and teaching us all how to uh, put up the UTSA uh, 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 sign. Uh, I am a UT, the real UT, the big UT in Austin graduate, not UT Tennessee. 
uh, and uh, which stole our 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 uh, colors and our symbol. Uh, and uh, but anyhow, we're thrilled. The um, next month, I just wanted to tell everyone that we are doing this uh, virtual presentation now uh, once a month. Uh, for this school year, 2022-2023. All of our rural schools are now invited to join us on our monthly calls. And next month, we will be speaking with um, uh, a school in Illinois. And the topic they have asked us to speak on are drones. And so um, uh, that presentation is November 22nd, I believe. And but all of your schools will get all of the details. We ask you to join us and uh, thank you so much schools for your participation. Uh, we had an idea, uh, but you make it possible. You turn it into a reality. And we're so proud of all of you and the students and for your interest and for your teachers and for your administration. Uh, we're here for you and uh, we're just thrilled that you're interested in, in participating. And Weedy, uh, we've only had two of these uh, uh, presentations and we have, so we have seven more to go, but it'll be very, very difficult for anyone to top your presentation. And uh, it was it was just fantastic. Uh, I had lots of thoughts as you were talking about shared experiences and other things, but uh, uh, you did such a terrific job. And on behalf of all of us and the students, uh, a special thanks uh, to you for putting this together and participating with us in this presentation. Th thanks, Wayne. It's it's easy to do good good presentation when you've got great material and it's compelling material. So yeah. All right. So uh, with that, we'll sign off. Until next time. Thank you all, and uh, bye to everyone.